baby on the drill. Alright, so this is the last lecture for the course uh, the semester. Um, and as I said, this would be a combination of the, the, the sort of final review for the final. Um, and then we'll finish off with the system pepper uh, rebuild based on what you guys voted on. So for what remains in this course, uh, there's sort of four things, or three, three things. Project four is due next week on Monday. Um, the extra credit will be due a week from now on Wednesday. Uh, and as I said, today is the day if you want to submit your, uh, you submit your article on the Google form that I sent on Piazza, if you want me to review it uh, from now until the next week or so, um, I, 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 I can do that. Okay, and get, provide you guys feedback. And then the final exam, which you guys are all super excited for, again, is on Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. And that'll be in Gates. So, so any, any questions about Project 4, real quickly? Any questions about the extra credit? Yes, in the back. Like, I'll start doing that today. I'll go through the list in the order who submitted first. I think right now it might be like five or six. Um, and I'll just send them back as I go. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? For project four, there's the set flush lock feature and the has flush lock feature in the uh, messenger disk manager. Are we supposed to use that to uh, make like different sets wait for the flush to finish? His question is, there's a, there's a flush log function in the disk manager, and his question is, should you, are you using that to make sure that threads wait? Yes. Because it'll pause until it's f-synced. Like, it's calling f-sync on, on the disk, on the operating system, and that stalls the thread because you're in the operating system waiting for the hardware to confirm that you've written out the disk. All right. Final exam. So who needs to come to this? If you're enrolled in the class, you want a grade, you need to come to the final exam. Uh, so this is the URL, and I'll post this on Piazza. Uh, the, the URL, the website is live, but the, I haven't posted the practice final exam, and I'll do that uh, later this week. But that, that web page there will take you to, again, the overview of, of what's covered on, on the, in, in the final exam. And well, I mean, we'll talk about that and what topics are covered, but that'll specifically say, you know, from this slide to this slide is, is what's covered. Right? So obviously the Volt TV stuff that we talked that, you know, we had the, the guest lecture on, on Monday, you know, I'm not gonna put that on the final exam. But everything else before that will be um, is applicable. So again, it won't be in this room, it'll be in the Gates building, 4401, which is the giant Rashid Auditorium, and I'll bring I'll bring breakfast for for everyone. Um, so what do you need to bring? So, as always, bring your CMU ID. You bring a calculator if you want, but obviously, if you, if you think about what we've done on the homeworks and projects so far, we haven't really done a lot of cal calculations, right? We're not estimating you know, the, the number of disk IOs for a join, right? So, you can bring it if you want, but you, you're not really gonna need it. Um, and then I'm allowing you to bring two pages now of notes, handwritten, double-sided. So don't take the slides, shrink them down. Everything has to be written by hand, okay? So, uh, if you want to, we had one kid do this uh, a year or two ago. He decided halfway through that he wanted to change into pajamas in the exam. Uh, I'm okay with that. You have to change in the bathroom. You can't change in front of everyone else, right? Um, do not bring your roommate. I also had this happen one year. Like, this, this, the kid shows up, and I'm like, who's this? And he's like, oh, this is my roommate. He just kind of like wanted to chill for a bit. It's a three-hour exam. Uh, and it took me for like, it took me like, a, like, like 10 seconds, like, wait, he's not in the class and he's just here. He's like, yeah, and we're just, we're just kind of hanging out. And I, I couldn't tell whether they were lovers. I, it, was, it was really bizarre. Do not bring your roommate, okay? So we don't have that awkward conversation. Um, the other thing too, and I'll send a reminder out, there's some Piazza, please fill out the course evaluation. Uh, and don't say like, oh, Andy's great, or Andy sucks, right? Like, Useful feedback would be, is what we're really looking for. And specifically, if there's anything you don't like, by all means, take shit on me, I don't care. If there's anything you don't like about the projects, the lectures, the homeworks, the exams, anything, just let me know and that way I can try to make the course better. Right? I teach this once a year 
and I take the feedback from, from previous years and, and, and try to improve it for the next people. So if you really hate the people, if you really hate your, your future classmates, you can screw them and be like, oh, there should be like five exams, there should be 20 homeworks, right? Um, but no, I mean, honestly, if there's something about the projects, whether like it was, uh, you know, the, the description wasn't clear, yes, I know about the issues with grade scope, but by all means, you can, you can list those out as well. Uh, one of the things we're thinking about maybe doing is, in, in future years, is, is you know, expanding the number of test cases we give you, or at least writing in English what each test case is doing. Right? So there's things like that as, as we see that the issues we have as the course progresses, we want to make them better. And I, I learned this through your feedback. So the undergrads are awesome. The undergrads by, like, just, just rail on everything. It's the master students who are like, oh, but Andy's so great, right? And that's not helpful. So I don't care. I can't see it. Like, it doesn't affect your grade. By all means, go to town. And like, I already won a teaching award last year, right? Because all the master students wrote Andy were, were so great. So like, they're not going to fire me if you say, this course sucks. Here's why, OK? So be, be vicious. Um, for next week, I'm actually traveling on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, so I, I, I'm not going to be around my normal office hours times. But I'll have office hours on Friday afternoon uh, on the, the 14th, the, the Friday before the, the final exam. If you can't make this, send me an email, and we can figure something out. If I have to call you on Skype, I can call you on Skype. OK? All right. So what do you need to know from the content we discussed before the midterm? Right? And I'm listing these five topics, but these are pretty high level and superficial, right? Like, or not superficial, but like, they're, I'm not going to ask you specific details about like, uh, how this hash table actually does overflows or things like that. You just need to be sort of like aware of what these things are and how they fit into the overall system. Like, if you magically forgot SQL immediately after you took the midterm, then you're screwed. You have other problems, right? But I may show you SQL and you can't say, I don't remember SQL, that was before the midterm, right? So buffer pool management, obviously understanding how things are swapped in and out and why we're doing that um, and how that relates to transactions and logging, the stuff you guys have done in project three, project four, uh, B plus trees and how they relate to uh, concurrency control and the, the overall storage models, like column store versus a row store. And again, think of this, the questions will be in, couched in what we talked about after the midterm, but we'll rely on these concepts to, uh, to, to to provide you the questions or to, to frame the questions. OK? All right, so the first thing we talked about was uh, parallel execution. Um, so you need to understand the difference between interoperator parallelism, intraoperator parallelism, and then inter and intra query parallelism. All right, so, so what would be intra, intra query parallelism? What does that mean? Single query, I can rec execute it in on different cores or different workers in parallel, right? And that's different than inter-query parallelism, is where I could have different queries, possibly from different transactions, and they're running on parallel, on different different workers. So we talked about the the the, the volcano model using the exchange operators to coalesce results between different parallel workers, and then you pass things along to the up up the query plan once you have all the results, all the intermediate results. We spent some time talking about embedded logic. Uh, we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of various techniques for taking logic you would normally have written in the application and putting it directly inside the database system. The real focus would be on user-defined functions and store procedures. Right, so understand the difference between, between these two concepts, understand when and when they, they do not work. Right, I'm, I'm obviously not going to ask you to write PLPG SQL because we didn't ask you to write this in the homework, and I, we don't want to have to grade it. But again, it's, it's the high-level concepts that, that actually matter. Then we spend a lot of time talking about transactions. All right? So obviously, you should understand what it means for something to say a data system to provide acid guarantees, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, what the difference is between those four concepts, how a database system could provide those guarantees, like what, what about the architecture, what, what additional functionality you have to have implemented in the system to provide ACID transactions. Then we spend a lot of time talking about conflict serializability and view serializability. So you should understand the difference between how to actually check if you have an execution schedule, whether it's, it's serializable or conflict serializable. But then you also need to understand how to actually generate a, a, a dynamic schedule on the fly. 
that, that would be uh, conflict serializable. Right? That's essentially what the two-phase locking timestamp ordering stuff we talked about. We talked a little bit about view serializability, and obviously I'm not going to ask you to write any proofs, but understand at a high level what view, ser view serializability allows that conflict serializability does not allow. Um, what does it mean for a, a schedule to be recoverable? Uh, how do you deal with cascading aborts? What are the different isolation levels that transactions could run at? And what are the anomalies they may or may, or may not be exposed to at these different isolation levels? Right, serializable was at the top, read uncommitted was at the bottom, and then you had uh, read committed and repeat or read below that. Then we talked about protocols of actually, again, how do you actually generate serializable schedules? And we had one entire lecture on two phase locking, understand between strict versus non strict as de defined in the homework and the projects, how you actually would implement deadlock detection versus deadlock prevention. Know the difference between wound and wait, or wound wait and wait and die. I think for the project, you guys are implementing wait die or wound wait. Wound wait, and then yeah, right, last year it was wait and die. So understand what the, the difference between those two things are. Understand how multiple granular locks come into play. Specifically, how do you use intention locks? Right, intention exclusive, intention shared, shared intention exclusive. What they mean to to lower levels in the. Uh, in the hierarchy, if you take an intention lock above, right, we could throw, we could show you two transactions, and, and you could tell us what's the minimum number of locks you need to acquire in the hierarchy to allow them both to run. Then we spent more time talking about um, uh, timestamp ordering or optimistic occurrence control protocols. So for the basic timestamp ordering protocol, the understand how it works, how you can apply the Thomas Wright rule to ignore writes from transactions that would, would otherwise abort. Uh, understand the three different phases in OCC. What does it mean to have a private workspace for a transaction when they apply updates? How does this all relate to multi-version multi concurrent control? So understand the, how you actually store the different versions, how do you order them, what are the implications of this for, for performance? How it actually affects other things like indexes, if I'm going oldest to newest versus newest to oldest and I update a tuple, do I, how do I update my indexes? And how, do we, how do we do garbage collection? How do we go back and find old versions we don't want anymore and clean them up? Do we want to do this all in the context of, of, a, of everything being transactional? Then we spent time talking about crash recovery. So you should understand the, the, the two key policies you can have in your buffer pool management implementation. Right? Steal versus no steal, force versus no force. So what, it, what does a steal policy mean? Yes, sorry. Yes. Okay. Absolutely, yes. So she said the steal policy means that the, the buffer the database system is allowed to write out dirty pages from the buffer pool and evict them, so you're gonna write them out the disk, even though those pages were modified by transactions that have not committed yet. Right? Under no steal policy, you cannot do that. Everything that a transaction modifies has to stay in memory. And of course, we said that if, if you go with no steal, then you never have to worry about when you crash and come back that there's dirty pages from uncommitted transactions on the disk because they, you, they never got written out. So therefore, you don't have to do any extra, extra work to, to put the database back to a correct state. But under the steal policy, because you could be writing out dirty pages, you have to use the log to figure out what the hell is going on and what pages should actually be rolled back, what pages should be uh, you know, left alone after a crash. So now what's the difference between force versus no force? Somebody other than her. Yes. Absolutely, yes. So he says, uh, let me rephrase what you said. When a transaction commits, force means when a transaction commits, you have to write all its dirty pages from the buffer pool manager out the disk and flush it. Right? Essentially, you call F sync. Right? And the transaction is not considered committed until all its dirty pages are written to disk. Right? And no force, you don't have to do that. So the for your project four, what are you implementing? 
force of, sorry, steel versus no steel. Steel, and, and force versus no force. No force, right. So if you use the right head log, then you're essentially doing uh, uh, steel, no force. Because when a transaction commits, all I care about is the right head log records are written out to disk or flushed to disk. I will flush out the, the dirty pages at some later point. But because the log's written at disk, that's all I need to be able to recover the database if I crash, to restore the, the pages back to the correct, correct state. All right, so again, we talked about right ahead logging. Uh, we talked about different logging schemes, physical versus logical versus physiological, right? Undo versus redo, what, what information you need to store for these different, different uh, techniques. All right, we talked about how to do checkpoints. So there's sort of three variants of the checkpoints. They don't really have names. One was like bad, okay, best. The best one was the fuzzy checkpoints. The, 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 the middle one, I think is what you guys are implementing in, in project four. Or you sort of pause everything and write, 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 write the, the pages out. Uh, and then we talked about how to do recovery from a write ahead log with checkpoints under, the, under Aries. So the main thing to understand here is what are the three phases for Aries? Right, uh, analyze, redo, undo. How do the log sequence numbers permeate throughout the entire architecture of the system to allow you to figure out what, what was going on? Right, what, what pages have been written out and your, uh, what pages that were modified by different log records have been written out? We talked about how to do the compensation log records to understand what, how, how they work. You're not doing that in project four, so again, we're not gonna ask you nitty gritty details but how they work in, 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 in concert with the, the dirty page table and the active transaction table during recovery. And then we finish up the semester talking about uh, distributed databases. So we, we talked about the different kinds of system architectures you could have, shared disks, shared memory, shared nothing. We talked about how to partition the database. We talked about how to do replication, master replica versus multi-master, active passive versus active active. Then we talked about how to use two-phase commit, all right, and the consensus protocols. Where obviously, again, we're not going to ask you to implement Paxos on the final exam because you'll be here for days, uh, and, we don't, and we have to grade it. So again, we, it's the high-level concept is what we care about here to understand the distinction of how these different uh, architectures work and what, what do they mean. Okay. All right. So any questions about the final? Yes. So you mentioned about two-phase commit. So last time you explained it as a two-phase commit, but that's not used to like read your two-phase commit. That's two as locking. There's strict locking, strict two-phase locking, and rigorous two-phase locking. Uh, we, we, we will be very specific, right? All right, two-phase locking is different than two-phase commit. Yes. But we'll see Spanner in a second. They use two-phase locking and two-phase commit. Any other questions? Everyone's really excited for the final exam, right? <laughs> okay. All right, so in the remaining time, let's talk about different database systems, which you guys voted on. So here is the, uh, the top 10 systems from the last three years that I've done this, right? Um, and what you see is that the, the, the top one and two have always been MongoDB and Spanner, right? MongoDB has always been number one, and then last year, Spanner actually turned out to be number one. Uh, they're not number one this year. Anybody take a guess which one's number one? Cockroach, right? So these, these are the results for this year. Um, so I always ask, so, for those of you that voted for CockroachDB, why? What's that? It's a funny name. It's a funny name. All right, that's one thing. You know. Who here has used CockroachDB? Nobody. All right. Um, is it because you see you don't like Hacker News and therefore you're interested in it? Or, or like, have you been talking to startups that are using it? I'm actually really curious. I'm not, like, so, in previous years, from MongoDB and Spanner, I asked the kids, why, why did you pick Mongo? Why did you pick Spanner? From Mongo, they said, oh, they thought about, they wanted, maybe want to use it for like a pet project or like a, you know, a little hobby thing they wanted to build, like a website. They were like, oh, let me use Mongo to try it out. For Spanner, they thought 
they said that they want to be able to go on the Google job interview and tell them something intelligent about Spanner, <laughs> right? Uh, and I told her, like, look, you're, it's like, Google's not going to hire you, and you're immediately going to go work with Jeff Dean on Spanner, right? Because he doesn't work on it anymore. Um, so, so is it cockroach? Is it just the name, or just because it's a lot of buzz, or like, are you just you're just dying to know about it? Uh, he says maybe somebody submitted it multiple. So maybe one person here is like, oh, I fucking love cockroach, right? <laughs> just, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so I mean, I'll, I'll go down real quickly about these other ones because we're going to focus on the top three here uh, in the time we have. So Amazon Aurora. Amazon Aurora is the Amazon's fork of MySQL. And, well, it's not, it, let me be clear. Aurora is a umbrella of a, so a class of database systems that can either look like based on either Postgres or MySQL. So you can get Aurora for MySQL or Aurora for Postgres, right? And so what they did is they modified the system to use a custom storage layer on EBS where they have pushed down logic about transactions and replication into the EBS layer. So if you and I use EBS, we just get sort of this like, uh, you know, simplistic block storage, right? Amazon controls the whole stack, so they actually put logic about transactions in the storage layer itself. And that's essentially what, what Aurora is doing. So, e so even though it's going to look like MySQL, it's like MySQL on steroids to run in, in Amazon's uh, data centers. Right? Uh, Redis is a uh, in-memory NoSQL system. Think of it as like the, the, it's almost like a Swiss army knife of a database system. So rather than doing SQL, you can do like, you can get sort of complex data types like sets and lists and, and hash tables. Um, and do, and, you know, do sort of simple manipulations on them. So it's in memory, it runs in a single thread engine like VoltDB, and that's how they get better performance. But they don't, as far as I know, they don't do transactions. Cassandra is, uh, it's a, like another NoSQL system. It was actually written by Facebook. Facebook decided we don't want to use this and just gave it away and open sourced it. And then a bunch of different companies saw it, picked it up, and actually expanded upon it. And it's sort of, it's a, it's a hybrid between sort of Google big table with column families, plus like the DynamoDB's consistent hashing with the rings. Again, I, my hand gestures don't mean anything to you guys, but um, this, I mean, this one's pretty popular. Elasticsearch is a uh, document database. We'll see Mongo in a second. Um, Think of like storing JSON documents, but they can do like full text searches on, on them, which we talked about earlier. They just went public, right? I think they just had an IPO uh, this year. Apache Hive is a um, query engine on top of HDFS and Hadoop. So you basically write SQL queries, it converts them to MapReduce jobs, and they run in, in Hadoop, right? Hive is actually pretty slow. Uh, Presto or um, now the, the other one's escaping me. Um, there's another one that's actually that's better than this. Um, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. It's terrible. There's another one. All right, it's better. Uh, Facebook Scuba. Scuba was a. Uh, I don't think it, I'm not sure if it's actually still around anymore. It's an in-memory database that for uh, time series metrics. So they have this. They ingest all this information from their various uh, from their their various you know applications like you know, pages read, pages written, lock times, things like that. And you can run analytics on, on, on it inside there. And then MySQL we spent a lot of time talking about already. All right, so let's jump into this. We'll start with Cockroach, SQL, or Spanner, and MongoDB. So uh, CockroachDB uh, was started in uh, 2015. Um, I actually went to go visit them last year. So this is, this is my view at the, the conference table. I sort of showed up to say hello, and they had a sort of meeting with me where they pelted me with questions for like an hour. Uh, it was kind of fun. Um, but they're really all in with this cockroach stuff. So this is in the lobby. They had the logo, and they made sort of like pixel art out of it. Like it's, it's in the wall. So like some people said, are they going to change their name? No, they're, they're going all in with cockroach, right? Um, and it's called cockroach because it's meant to be like the database that never dies. Like the cockroaches are notoriously hard to kill. Uh, and so I get the metaphor. Um, you know, when they were first announced were CockroachDB on Hacker News, people were like, oh, this is terrible. It's not that bad, right? I, I'm OK with the name. OK, so Cockroach was started in 2015 by ex-Google employees. Um, 
And although the people that started CockroachDB had not worked on Spanner, they had used Spanner at Google. And so they sort of set out the, the goal of the startup was for them to build the open source version of Spanner. Um, we'll see Spanner in a second. Um, the, what I'll say is that at a, at, at a high level, yes, it, I mean, they're trying to have, achieve the same goals as Spanner, like a distributed uh, fault tolerant transaction processing database system. But underneath the covers, the architecture is, 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 is slightly different. So it's not like an exact clone of Spanner. And I don't think the company ever advertised themselves as being the open source version of Spanner. Um, if that sort of got uh, you know, assigned to them by the internet. And I, but I, I think they've done a pretty good job at making clear that we're not, they're not trying to claim that the open source version of Spanner. So at this point in the, in the semester, what's awesome is that I can rattle off a bunch of uh, keywords about the architecture of the system. And you should understand what I'm talking about. At, again, at a high level, you can conceptualize what ex how exactly the system works without having to me describe all the nitty, nitty gritty details. So it's a distributed database. It's decentralized, shared nothing. Um, they're going to be using a log structured storage architecture at the individual nodes. And they're, they're using RocksDB um, to make this work. Um, and the concurrent control model they're going to use is multi versioned OCC. And the only isolation level they're going to support is serializable, right? So again, what's nice about this is, again, I don't have to go into details about how all this works. At this point, this, this slide right here, you could understand, oh yeah, it's a distributed transaction database system that's shared nothing, right? So the, the way they always like to describe their architecture is in terms of, of, of these layers, and that's sort of like what we talked about at the beginning of the semester, right? We talked about how the, we had those layers, we had the, the, the disk manager, and they had the buffer pool manager, and above that we had concurrent control, and above that we had the execution engine. Right? So that's how they're describing their architecture. So at the very bottom on a single node, you have the storage layer. And again, that's just RocksDB. So the way to think about this diagram is, in this semester, we've covered this box here. Right? We now know how to build a single node storage manager that we could use underneath the covers for something like CockroachDB, which has all the layers on top of this. Right? So above that, you have a replication layer. Then you have a router layer, and that's, again, that's like the coordinator for transactions, or, 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 or the, the routing table to decide where the data you actually need is located. And above that, you have a distributed tra tra a transactional key value store uh, database API. And then above that, you have a SQL layer. So the way to, again, think about this in the context of our single node architecture, uh, this is sort of like the this is like the, the page directory telling you where to go sort of find things, and above this is like the buffer pool manager to say, hey, I want this page, I want or I want this key in, in their in their parlance, and then it knows how to go find all the data you need from down below it. And then when you write to a, a single node, they're going to use something that looks like Paxos. I'll show in a second. That basically to replicate it to the different nodes, and they can do this all making in, in the context of a transaction that's fault tolerant. So so the the Instead of having the concept of pages in, uh, in CockroachDB, at the upper layers of the system, it's a, it's a key value API. So you can sort of think like we had this page directory that says, I want page one, two, three. The page directory told you where on disk, go get it. In CockroachDB, the, the transactional key value store allows you to say, hey, I want key one, two, three. And it'll tell you what node to go get it at. And then the, the, within, for a single key, it's going to be multiple pages. So you can go fetch larger chunks of the database at a time. So again, the bottom is, is RocksDB. And then the, re the replication and consensus protocol is going to be this thing called Raft, which is a variant of Paxos. Um, it, Paxos was invented in the 1990s. Uh, it's considered notoriously hard to, diff uh, to implement. Raft came along out at, of at a project out of Stanford um, called RamCloud, which is a, uh, their own distributed key value store. And then they proposed, here's the consensus protocol called Raft that was, they, they touted as being easier to understand and implement than Paxos. I slightly disagree with that characterization. I don't think it's just as difficult to implement as Paxos. Um, but what Raft did that the Paxos people didn't do is that there's a ton of open source implementations of, of the Raft protocol available in a bunch of different languages. So if you were building a distributed system in, in so Cockroach, CockroachDB is in Go, so you can, there's an open source implementation of, of Raft in Go that you could just download and use in, in, in your system. There is no 
So there's like libraph. There's a library available to use raft, the raft protocol. There's no libpaxos. So I think that part of the reason why you see a lot of systems using raft instead of paxos. But at a high level, they're just as hard to implement. Right? So the Concurrentio protocol in Rock CockroachDB, as I said, is, uh, is multi-version OCC. So in Spanner, we'll see in a second, they're going to sign transactions timestamps from hardware-based clocks. In, in CockroachDB and in, in every other system, you can't rely on the clocks being super synchronized. Right? You can have drift over time. NTP can't guarantee that the clocks are being synced at, at, at really tight bounds. So what they're instead going to use is a hybrid clock method where it's a, you assign a time stand that's a combination of the current physical time that it's loosely synchronized with, with and through NTP. And then you have essentially like a little local counter that you can use to augment that. And that's how you're going to guarantee that transaction timestamps are globally unique and always going in increasing order. So this link here is, is to the paper that is, that's a, out of the University of Buffalo of a distributed computing professor there who describes how you actually implement hybrid logical clocks. Um, we have our own approach in another system we help, help build. Um, we call physiological clocks. And at the high level idea is the same. It's a combination of, high, of physical clocks plus logical clocks. I'm going to have to um, cut all this out and bleep it, but the, this paper actually describes actually how to do it. There's another professor down in Texas that apparently stole his ideas and, and patented it. Uh, but I, whether there's litigation or not, um, uh, I don't know. So whether Cockroach gets, gets DB gets sued because this guy implemented it, somebody else patented it, and, they, and this guy is okay with Cockroach DB using the ideas, the Texas guy may not be. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. So when transactions, again, they, they get timestamps, and we're going to use that to figure out the global order of their operations. We're doing OCC, so we're going to write into a private workspace. But with multi-versioned concurrent control, there's not really sort of a separate location where you write things. We're still going to write into the global database. Anybody can see them, but we're going to mark these tuples that would normally be in our private workspace as being what, are called in, what they call intents. So it's additional metadata to say, this transaction wrote this record. Here's my timestamp range of, oh, here's my timestamp when I started, and I haven't committed yet. So other transactions come along and, and start scanning versions to try to write, find the right version they want would know not to read this. Again, that's basic, basic MVCC protocol. Now, all the metadata about the transactions themselves is going to be stored in the distributed key value store. Right? This is completely decentralized. There's no one central coordinator we can always go to and say, what's the state of my transaction or what's the state of this, this record? Right? So we're going to store this in our own key value store and allow anybody else to, to read it and, and figure out what's going on in our system. So at a high level, again, the, the architecture will look like this. So we have this global logical namespace. And just think of this as like the, the, the page directory that in, in the disk manager and a single node database. But now it's, again, it's, it's this key value pairs. And so the way to think about this is that the, at, the, at the very beginning, you have the, you map from keys to a location. And that's going to tell you for a given key, you know, where to go find the data you need, right, on a different node. In the namespace for the, for the, for the table and the indexes and everything else you're storing in the database, the key value path mapping is going to be from the key to the actual data. So this thing tells you what node to find the data you want, and then anything in here is the actual data. So again, it looks just like the disk manager page directory. All my, my entire database is broken up into pages. And if I have a page ID, I can go, I can go get that page. So if I have the key of the, of, the, of the record I want, the range that I want, then I know how to do a lookup in, in the system table to tell me what node has that data that I want, and I can go get it. So they're going to have a, a master, master replica replication. So we're going to run some round of Raft or Paxos and elect a leader. And so all your writes are going to go to this leader, and this will be done at the, at a, using a key value API. So they're going to convert all the SQL statements you would normally invoke in your application into the underlying key value, uh, key value operations. So we send all our writes here, and then there's you know, the distributed concurrency control to figure out uh, whether our transaction conflicts with any other actor on transaction running at the same time. We use our, our hybrid timestamps that we got assigned when we started to figure out what order we should actually allow these to commit. If we know this thing's allowed to commit, then we just run a uh, propose a change to the RAC protocol to replicate the data to the different nodes. 
So again, at a high level, it's all the concepts we talked about before. There, you know, I showed before, just here's all the different possible things you can do. When you actually implement this, you, you sort of pick, uh, you, know, you, you pick what design decisions you want to make, and you put all the things together to make your full system. So they're doing, they're doing master, replica, re, master replica replication with OCC. And instead of using Paxos or two-phase commit, they're using Raft. But it achieves the same thing. Any questions? So it's SQL-based, it's transactional, it's fault-tolerant, it uses RocksDB underneath the covers, and then they have their own transaction coordination layer above that. Yes? He said, can you be more specific about the key value API? So this here, what I'm trying to show you, this is the uh, think of a logical key space. And the keys are not going to be like for individual records. They're going to be for ranges of records. And, this, and then it's going to be sorted based on some, some, you know, some value that you want to keep things sorted. So if I want to figure out where, say, say where the key one, two, three is in, Say I have to do a lookup, say, sorry, I have a column called ID. I want to find my tuple where ID equals one, two, three. And I want to use the index to find out where that is. So what I need to do is I need to consult the system catalog and say, I know I want to do you know, a lookup in this table, and here's the key I'm looking for, and I, therefore the catalog is going to know you have an index that can do a lookup on that, on that key. So it's going to tell you, OK, well, the starting point that you want to start your traversal into the index is going to be at some, some offset inside the key, the key space for this index, because this is going to be the root of, of the B plus tree. So then the key value API is going and fetching all the, um, for lack of a better term, pages that correspond to the index you want to do your traversal. Then at the very bottom of the index, you're going to say, all right, here's the actual, here's the mapping to the record ID. Or which is going to be again in this in this key space up here. So, so think of this as like I might, my query is running here and it's just well it's running over here, but like I'm getting I'm getting the pages I need from the key space here, and then I can do all the same things that that we we talked about before. But instead of having it go getting through the buffer manager and which goes gets it from disk as you would on a single node system, I'm getting it from this distributed key value store system. This is not unique to Cockroach DB. This is how a lot of distributed uh, databases work. Foundation DB does the same thing. Right? If you go read the literature for Cockroach DB, they're going to talk about ranges, they're going to talk about keys. Just, you can think of them as being pages. OK. Google Spanner. All right, so. Um, so Spanner has been around since uh, 2011, I think, when the paper came out. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, may I ask that, uh, like, uh, what do you think the, the, the most unique uh, point uh, or important technique for a to be uh, that's separate from other? So his question is, what do I think is the most unique aspect of CockroachDB that would separate it from other distributed databases? How about distributed transactional databases? Um, There's nothing unique about what they're doing at a high level from a scientific standpoint, right? MVCC is old, OCC is old, Raft is from Stanford, right? Like all those concepts are not new, right? The hard thing though is engineering, right? So getting this thing to actually work and be correct and fault tolerant, like they, it, it, they're, they're pulling that off. So that is actually, that's actually a big deal, right? And having to deal with all the weird corner cases, lost messages, one node goes down, one node comes back, right? Like all that kind of crap. Like it's one thing to write the paper to describe how actually you would implement this, but actually have something actually is re reliable and running in, in, in the real world is a big deal. So whether they're more reliable than the other transactional distributed databases that are available, TidyB, Yugabyte, um, FoundationDB, I, I, I don't know. But if, if, they're, if they are able to achieve the fault tolerance claims that they're, they're, they're claiming, then that's impressive. OK, Spanner. Um, so again, Spanner is Google's distributed transaction processing database system. Um, and as I said, the, the CockroachDB guys used Spanner when they worked at Google. 
and then they sort of built something that is sort of similar to it um, at a high level. So I gave a talk in 2013 in, in Google's office in Kirkland in Seattle, and I, I met with some of the, the Spanner SQL team, that, which is different than Spanner. We'll, we'll, I'll cover that in a second. There's actually four versions of Spanner. Um, so when I gave the talk, I wanted to talk about a, a bunch of different new SQL transaction processing database systems, and I had to show something uh, on my slides to say to represent the, the Google Spanner logo, because um, back then there, there wasn't one. So I, I actually made this myself. Um, they didn't like that, and then they, they gave me uh, this uh, piece of art. This is actually the real internal Google Spanner logo as of uh, 2013. Um, but now with the advent of the, the cloud-based version that you as, as an outside non-Google employee can actually use, this is actually the current uh, Google Spanner logo. So to understand the, the why Google built Spanner, you have to understand what they were doing before them. So back in 2006, Google wrote a paper on, on a system called Bigtable. Google actually does a really good job at publishing uh, or writing you know, research papers that describe the various database systems that they built, right? And they're extremely influential because people assume, oh, Google's the best, they must be doing something right. So the people go take their, whatever, whatever they publish and go try to recreate it and make their own version of it, right? All right. So this, this, is, this is a system called Bigtable from 2006. The, the open source clone of this is HBase. HBase is, 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 the, is the Hadoop based clone. Hadoop, Hadoop is also a clone of, of MapReduce out of Google. Right? It's a clone of, of the Bigtable system. So the, this is sort of one of the first NoSQL systems that came out in 2006, 2005. Um, and the, in this paper, they talk about if you really want to achieve the kind of scalability that you need to have in a distributed database that Google needs for, for their infrastructure, you had to give up SQL. You had to forego joins. You had to give up transaction, right? And in the case of Bigtable, it was a uh, a column family system, sort of think of like a key value system, that ran on GFS, which was the early version of the distributed Google file system. So then they, so this was sort of how they thought they were going to go forward. Um, at the time, though, the Google AdWords, which is still the, you know, was then and still is now the biggest moneymaker for Google, that was actually running on a uh, sharded version of MySQL. So they wrote their own middleware layer, their route queries over different MySQL installations, right, because they, they needed transactions in that environment. So there was another paper in 2011 uh, that came out on a system called Megastore. Um, most of you have probably never heard of this. Um, I don't know whether it's still used. But this was sort of an early incarnation of Spanner where they had, wanted to add support for transactions in a distributed environment. Um, as far as I know, this did not get a lot of traction internally at Google because the, the performance was not, not, not that good. So then, based on this experience, they went off and then ended up building what we understand to be now Spanner now. So I think the paper came out in 2011, uh, but it's like, you know, Google had been working on it, I think, for five or six years before then. So it's been around since 2008, 2009, maybe before then. Um, so it is a distributed transaction processing system that's geo-replicated. And it's going to be decentralized uh, transaction management with a shared, nothing, or sorry, shared disk architecture. So they're going to have, uh, just like a big table would write data out to a shared disk system running on GFS. Spanner is going to write out to some underlying distributed uh, file system as well. I forget what it is actually now. But the name has changed. So it's going to do log structure storage on disk, right, which we've talked about. Um, and it's going to support physical denormalization, which we'll show in the next slide. And they're going to use that to reduce the amount of I.O. you have to do to process queries. Now, for the concurrency control part, this is the most interesting aspect of Spanner. This is the part that's really the most complicated to understand, and this is the part that makes it actually really unique from, from everyone else. So they're going to be doing uh, strict two-phase locking with multi-versioning and using both multi-Paxos, or multi-Paxos is where instead of having anybody be able to propose something, you, 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 take, you, you take turns having a leader, and, and then it's, a, it's the only one allowed to propose things, and then every so often you renew its, its lease on being the leader. So they're going to use multi-Paxos for uh, Transactions that that within a single Paxos group, and then if I have to talk to different Paxos groups, I'll use two-phase commit. 
So the key thing about what Spanner is going to uh, achieve that no other system achieves, and as far as I know, this is unique to Google's operating environment. I don't really, I haven't really heard of any other applications that actually need this, but they need to achieve what is called external consistency. Sometimes called strict serializability or linearizability, right? And the basic idea here is that we want to have uh, the order and then that transactions commit in the system is the order that they enter the system. Right? Remember when I talked about serializability before, I said that two tr transaction one can show up, transaction two shows up later, but because we're allowed to interleave our operations any way we want, it may actually be the case that transaction two commits first. In, in external consistency, you cannot do that. So they're going to do that for write transactions, and then any read-only transactions are going to be able to run uh, without acquiring any locks in the system and run on consistent snapshots in your Paxos group. So I'll, I'll cover, I'm going to spend most of our time talking about the control part, um, but I'll talk a little about the physical denormalization, because I think we, we mentioned this before, and we'll see this again in a second at MongoDB. But one of the big things that in the, in the big table system and earlier NoSQL systems, everyone claims that, oh, joins are really slow. You don't want to do joins. Uh, so in an OTP environment, they're not wrong, because most of the times you want to do foreign key lookups between two tables, and if those two tables now are, are physically located in, in different pages, now I'm doing additional I.O. to go get, you know, for a single record or single query, I'm going to different locations to get data at two different places. So what Spanner allows you to do is if you have like a foreign key reference between two tables, so we have a user's table and an album's table, and then the album's table, we have a, a foreign key reference on the user ID here. So they allow you to have this additional uh, uh, pragmas at the end of your create table statement to tell you that the, the, all the tuples for this table here should be interleaved in the pages of its parent table. So that means physically on disk, say each of these represents a single page, I'll have one user record and I'll have all the contents that that, that table has, but then also in line with it will be all the album records that I have. So now if I want to do a join, get, get for a single user, get all you know, user info and all their albums, I ideally can only have to do one page fetch into the, the, the distributed system, the, the file system, to go get all that data. Whereas if I was not de denormalizing like this, I'd have to go get the page from the user's table and go get the page from the, uh, from the albums table. And they want to do this because, again, they're running in a shared disk architecture so the, the, the disk they're reading from is not going to be local to the machine where we're actually running the query. Right? So the latency in that case might be now you know, 40 to 50 milliseconds to go get something from the underlying file system. So if I can now pack everything in into a single, single page in order to compute this query, then that's one less round trip I have to do to go get data. So this is not unique to Google. Uh, I think I mentioned this before when we talked about this during the semester. IBM first did this in the 1970s, right, in System R. And they decided to bail on this idea when, in, in the 1980s when they made DB2 because this just became a pain to uh, implement, right, because this were too slow. Yes? Uh, so in this case, the user was running one and the user manually stuff, but shared the album stuff. So, uh, sorry, say it again, sorry. Uh, the user was running one and the user 990 shares the uh, same album. In this example here, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the first one. In this example, no, right? Th these are these are different. So the user one zero zero one has album nine 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 zero and nine nine one. Oh, okay. Right. So that means that the album is uh, in the same disk as the user. Yeah. So this like this is a page. Okay. Like for one page for for user one zero zero one, with one fetch, I get the page and I get the user plus their albums. Right, so his statement is that means the, sh the albums are not shared by multiple users. In this example, they're not. If they are, then you have to be, you either have to not denormalize it, or you have to make, make multiple copies of it. In many use cases, though, they're not going to be shared. Right, so again, like this is, we'll see this in a second with MongoDB. Think, again, think of like Amazon. You have your orders, you have your customer account, you have your orders, and you have the order items you bought in each order, right? So it's a one-to-one -one map, or it's a one-to-end mapping going way down. So for every customer, they can have multiple orders 
but those orders only belong to one customer. So I could pack those in together and not worry about having to share things. Something that would be shared would be things like, um, uh, like the, the product information of the item I bought. And that I wouldn't want to denormalize. Okay. So let's talk about the currency control stuff. So buckle up. So they're going to be doing multi-version concurrency control, restrict two-phase locking using wound weight deadlock prevention. And the reason why they're doing deadlock prevention is because then you don't have to do distributed deadlock detection. Right? All you need to do is look at the timestamps of transactions to figure out who should come first and who should get killed. Right? But now if I'm geo-replicated, meaning I, I, it's not just I'm running, I don't have copies of the database in, you know, on one rack, or even one data center, they're all across the world. And I need to keep everything synchronized. This is when things start to get really tricky. Like, how do I ensure that uh, the clocks are in sync at all these different uh, data centers? Again, I can use NTP, but NTP is not going to be super, super accurate. Like, I think the range might be like 250 milliseconds, right? So, and in, in Google's environment for their particular workload, this is, this is targeting the ads, like the Google AdWords stuff, they want these things to be externally consistent because they want to make sure that you only, that we're, they're deducting the right amount of money every time they show an ad for you. So think of this, if I, if I, if I give Google $100 to show, show, I want to show ads, Google wants to make sure that they only show me, show, show exactly $100 worth of ads, right? Because if I, because if, if, if they're not completely synchronized, I may show an ad in the US, I may show an ad in China, and when I showed the ad in the US, I ran out of my $100, and it, but it didn't know that in China, so it still showed, me the ad, showed an ad in China, so it gave away its product for free. So it didn't want to do that. So that way, you want to keep everything in synchronized to avoid having people get more ads than, than they paid for. So the way they're going to keep their clocks more in sync than you could through just software is actually through specialized hardware. So for every single data center, they're going to have, they installed both uh, atomic clocks, uh, which count the number of seconds based on how, I think, either like atoms or electrons come off, um, I think, some metal, barium or something like that, or beryllium. Uh, and then they're also going to have on the roof G GPS receivers that are going to pick up the locations of, from, the, from the clocks on the satellites and use that to keep the clocks super synchronized. So they're going to be able to, I think the, the balance they can achieve is like within like 7 millisecond accuracy at every single data center, which is amazing. So we'll discuss how this is all going to work in a second, but let's understand how they're going to do replication. So the database is going to be broken up into tablets. These are, so think of these, they're called tablets for, I think for historical reasons, because in the big table paper they called them tablets. But think of the, these are just logical shards. Everything is down, down on some kind of shared disk system. And the different nodes will be responsible for, for, for some portion of it, which they define as a tablet. So when in each uh, tablet group, you're going to use Paxos to elect a leader. And this is where you're going to do all your, your, your rights into that, that master node. And then you'll use Paxos to keep those guys in, in sync within, within the, the tablet group. But any time a transaction needs to span tablet groups, you're going to use two-phase commit to make sure that you're allowed to commit on the other side and everything is completely synchronized. So let's look at an example. So I have one tablet, tablet A. And again, and this is all going to be, and, and I'm going to have two other replicas for it uh, across three different data centers. And this is going to be called a Paxos group. So I'm going to run Paxos, elect a leader, and that's where all my, my rights are going to go to for transactions that modify any data that's in within this tablet. So any, any modifying transaction always goes here. And then I'm going to run two-phase locking with uh, deadlock prevention, because if I have transactions running at the, at the same time, I can make sure that they can guarantee they're executing in serializable order. So when a transaction wants to commit, we run a round of Paxos, and we propagate the updates from the leader to the, to the replicas. right? And then they come back and agree to apply the changes, and then the transaction is considered committed. Right? And just to be clear, this is across this, this is across geographical locations. So this might be a data center in Virginia, and this might be a data center in Seattle. 
right? It's not, not on the, you know, different nodes in the same data center. This is going over the wide area network. So now what you can do is, in, in, in Spanner, is if you have read-only transactions, they can actually run on the, the, the replicas, the non-leader uh, nodes in your, in your Paxos group, uh, using snaps to isolation. So again, the, time, the transactions are going to be time, assigned timestamps when they show up, and they can run on the, the different data centers and be guaranteed they're not going to see any data from transactions that haven't committed yet. Right? You can see what the data was. You see a snapshot of the database at different timestamps. Right? For, for some queries, that's OK. Again, so this is all within a single Paxos group. If I have a transaction that has to span Paxos groups, then I have to run two-phase commit to tell, you know, to, to coordinate with them and say, can we also commit as well? So within, again, within a Paxos group, I just need a quorum of the replicas to agree that we're, we have to commit. In this case here, with, with two-phase commit, I have to have everyone agree to do this. And then within the Paxos group for this other tablet up here, it's going to run Paxos internally for itself as well to synchronize with its replicas. So is this clear? So hopefully you can see how we, we, we discussed all these sort of building blocks in the, throughout the entire semester. And now we can build up something more complicated and see how, how it all sort of fits together. So what's the tricky thing about this to do deadlock prevention in a distributed environment? I've already sort of said this already. What, how do you decide whether one transaction is allowed to commit, or there's conf whether you have two transactions that could conflict because they want to acquire the lock on the same, same item, how do you decide whether to kill one versus the other? What's that? What, say, say it again, sorry. All right. All right. Let's assume he said timestamps, right? <laughs> so Spanner is going to order transactions based on physical time, the wall clock time. Now that's different than CockroachDB. CockroachDB was wall clock time plus uh, a logical counter, right? They had a hybrid hybrid timestamp. Spanner is going to be completely physical, right? And they're going to do this because they're, they're going to be able to guarantee this is how they're going to achieve linearizability because since every single node in throughout the entire world and their data centers are going to have completely synchronized clocks, that if I'm given timestamp one and you're given timestamp two, I know that that in in real time. I become I come before you. I don't have to worry about your clock being you know way farther ahead than, than I am. They still it's still going to be slightly off, but we'll see how to deal with that in a second. So you have to do this, and if you want to guarantee external consistency or linearizability, because you want to be able to say that if T one finishes before T two, then we T two should be able to see any result of T one. So it need, needs to know about it because right, that, that's how we achieve that strict serializability. So Within each Paxos group, the, 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 we're going to decide how we order, how we're going to commit transactions based on these timestamps, just doing the, the wound weight technique, right? It's when we have to span, uh, it's how we're going to actually synchronize with, across these different data centers is actually when things get tricky. So this is where Google introduced something called true time. So true time is, this is, this is again, there's another unique aspect of Spanner that no other system has. So true time is going to be an API that, or like a service API they're going to have internal at Google that Spanner can invoke to get what the current time is. And that's going to, that clock is going to be synchronized based on the hardware devices. So, but instead of getting a single value for what my timestamp is, like timestamp one, timestamp two, timestamp three, I'm actually going to get a range. And they're going to use this to bound how long you have to wait to see whether anybody else shows up at, at, your, at your node with a timestamp that's less than you. Because if they're less than you, then it, or achieving you know, linearizability, then they need to commit before you do. And so you could have to wait forever, because you don't know how, how off those clocks are going to be at the different data centers. But because you're using true time with these hardware devices, they know they have a bounded error rate, a, bound, a, bounded, a bounded amount of time they have to wait. So the way to think about this is, the, the devices are going to have some error defined by epsilon. And you're going to say it's either going to be, the current time is going to be either within 
within epsilon above me or be within epsilon below me. So I'm going to have the earliest time, I'm going to have the earliest mark where this timestamp actually could be, and I can have the latest mark where this time could be. I don't know which one it, where, I, where I fit, but it doesn't matter. I can use these to figure out how long I need to wait. So again, we already said this, but every, every data center has the GPS and atomic clock devices. Um, they're going to go from just, you know, doing software-based synchronization, which might be 250 to 500 milliseconds, down to uh, uh, 7 milliseconds. So every, I think every th so often, every 30 seconds, they, get, they refresh and keep and, and tighten the bounds and get back to about a 7 millisecond uh, uh, drift. And you have to do this again because the, the hardware clocks on the actual CPUs themselves are not super accurate. Right? They're like some little crystal thing that counts, that, does, that counts forward in time. Where the atomic clocks are counting like how atoms move off or electrons come off uh, a piece of metal. So they're going to have these different synchronization demons with every single cluster. That way you have uh, fault tolerance within the, the data center to keep all these clocks in sync. And that way they can distribute the load of all the different spanner nodes who need to get what the current timestamp is. They can go to these different uh, services within the data center. And they're going to keep talking to each other all over uh, within the data center and across the different data centers to make sure everyone knows what's going on and everyone's always in sync. So let's see how we use true time. So let's say I have a transaction that comes along and, and wants to execute. The, I run at this point and I start acquiring locks, right? And I, and I do whatever changes I want to do, right? And then now I want to commit. Again, we're doing strict two-phase locking, so we're, we hold our locks to the very end. So I want to commit at this point here, and so I ask the data system is going to ask true time what the current timestamp range is, like what is now giving you back, and it's going to give you back a again the 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 high water mark and the low water water mark, the, the earliest and the latest this number could be. So I'm going to be able to say that the current timestamp is either going to be in the, in this range here, and so I'm. I think I'm in the middle here, but I don't know. And I also don't know if anybody else is going to show up at my, at my database or my node here with a timestamp that's less than I am. Therefore, they should get preference before, over, over me. So I need to wait until this point here, which is the, the total amount of time I have to wait as defined by my range to see if anybody's ever going to show up with a, a smaller timestamp. After this point here, right? so this is just the average epsilon put together like that. So after this point here, I've waited th this amount of time. I know nobody else is going. Nobody else could show up. Someone else could show up with a lower timestamp than me, but I've waited long enough, and I'm allowed to commit, and they'll have to abort. So the 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 basic idea of what true time is giving you is this tighter bounds on how long you have to wait to see if someone's going to show up, because they might be running on on, a, on another data center. If they do show up, then we just use regular two-phase locking, uh, the, the wound and wait, to decide who gets preference over the other. So this is, this is the key aspect of Spanner that makes it different than everyone else, that they're using these hardware clocks to get ranges to bound the amount of time they have to wait. In the back, yes? So her question is, if someone shows up in the middle here, right, with a timestamp that's less than I am, yeah. how do you know who gets preference? Uh, I think the answer is that you have, uh, I think there's a global ordering of like the, the, the node IDs within the data center. So if we have, if we have exactly the same timestamp, uh, then, then if, your, I mean, if your node ID is less than mine, then you get preference. Use that for tie breaking. That's a standard technique as well. All right, so as I sort of alluded to in the beginning, this, what I'm describing here was defined in the original Spanner paper. There's, there's three other versions of Spanner. So uh, two years later in 2013, Google put out a paper about a system called F1. So this was now, in Spanner, it was a pessimistic system using two-phase locking. F1 is a optimistic system using OCC built on top of Spanner. The other tricky thing about Spanner is like I think in the, in the original paper, it looks like they're describing something that, that looks like SQL, like they support SQL. The original version of Spanner didn't actually support SQL. 
So they built F1 to have support for SQL because they wanted to use this to replace the MySQL, uh, MySQL cluster they were using for all the ads. So F1 was built to be specifically for the ads system where Google makes all their money. So it's basically the same thing uh, that we talked about with OCC, where they're going to just use these timestamps to figure out in the order that, that transactions should be allowed to commit, and they have a validation phase to figure out uh, who conflicts with who and who's allowed to proceed versus, versus the other one, right? So they just store this timestamp information inside a spanner just as a, like a hidden like internal column. So from Spanner's point underneath the covers, it, it, it just sees a column. It doesn't know anything about how it's being used. But then up above this in the, in the F1 coordinator, it's able to, it uses that information to figure out uh, who's, you know, who acquires the lock or who's allowed to do what. So F1 was built for, uh, the, as I said, for the AdWords teams down in Mountain View. At the same time, they were building another version of Spanner called Spanner SQL up in Seattle that at a high level look, had the same sort of basic architecture as F1. And I asked them, why did you, you guys build two versions of, of F1? And they said that because F1 was for the ads, that, that's the golden calf of Google. That's where they make all their money. So the, the, the regular riffraff of Google is not allowed to use it. So they built Spanner SQL for all the unwashed masses at Google. Right? Um, the fourth version of Spanner is now a database as a service that Google will sell you. Um, called Spanner Cloud, uh, Google Cloud Spanner. So just like an Amazon, you can go get RDS or Aurora as a service. You can go give Google your credit card, and you get access to their distributed database that uses Spanner. Uh, I've never used it. I've, the benchmark numbers look, look pretty good, um, but it, it is quite expensive. So this is actually the fourth version. So they, they built another version that's available to, to everyone else. So if you go work, at, go to Google. If, if, you, if, you, if you're an employee at Google, you're probably going to end up using Google Spanner SQL. If you're at a startup outside of Google and you want to use Spanner, you'll end up using Cloud Spanner. How much, of the, how much code they share, I, I, I don't actually know. All right, so any questions about Spanner? The main takeaway to remember is that they're using the hardware clocks to, to bound the amount of time you have to wait for a transaction to have a lower timestamp than you. But they're still doing two-phase locking, multi-versioning, uh, just like we talked about before. Okay, let's finish up quickly with Mongo. So, uh, the same actually, the same day I went to go visit Mongo or CockroachDB in New York City, I also went to go visit Mongo. I said, "This is the picture of their lobby." I took took a picture of the sign because I liked it. Um, CockroachDB is actually in a cool part of uh, in New York City in Flatiron. MongoDB is in Times Square, which is, is basically hell on earth. Um, so it's right near like Times Square, and they're, they're like around the corner. But you have to walk through like all like the, the people wearing the Elmo costumes and, and the Superman costumes. It's a, it's a <laughs> show. Um, so MongoDB is a distributed, shared nothing, document database system. So it's one of the one of the first NoSQL systems that really took, got a lot of traction outside of Google. So a document database is, doesn't mean like a Microsoft Word document, doesn't mean like a PDF. Think of like a JSON document, a JSON object, or an XML document, or a Python dict, something like that. Right? So the, at a high level, it's, it's going to look a lot like a relational database in terms of how they organize the, the data, but they just use different terms. So again, instead of a tuple, they call it a document. Instead of a table, they call it a, uh, a collection. Right? So it's going to use a centralized routing architecture with a shared nothing uh, storage. Um, and just in, in MongoDB version 4 that came out this year, they just added support for multi-document transactions. So now you can have transactions that span multiple objects and across the, the entire distributed infrastructure. So the one thing I, I think I, was sort of interesting to point out is the open source license is this thing called server-side public license. This is actually a license that MongoDB invented. They, they originally were AGPL. But they came out with this year with extra precautions about uh, making sure that people don't take the MongoDB open source code and then go use it in, in their, as a cloud service uh, and make money off of it. Because um, Mongo wants to sell their own cloud service. I actually think this is a good idea. I, I don't know whether this is, this is in response to Amazon or somebody, some company in China. Um, but this is actually a very interesting concept that is unique in databases, open source databases, and we'll see whether they get uh, where this goes. So just like in Spanner, 
uh, MongoDB's documents, they, they're pushing the idea of doing uh, physical denormalization. Because again, Mon MongoDB is not going to support SQL. It doesn't, it originally didn't, didn't support transactions, it does now. It originally didn't support joins, it does now. But they were always pushing this idea of pre joining things. Right? And the example I, I gave before, with the customer's orders and order items, right? from a relational standpoint, it would look like this. And you have, to do, you have to do separate fetches if you want to join these things together. But they would argue what you really want to do is just embed in everything inside of a single document. So for a single customer, I have the list of orders. And for every single order, I have the list of order items. So in JSON, it looks like this. right? And as we said, long, this works out great as long as you're, you're, you're not sharing data across different objects. Because otherwise, you have duplicated data. All right, so query execution is is through this JSON-based API. So again, MongoDB originally came out and said, oh, we're not going to do joins, we're not going to do transactions, we're not going to do SQL. They do joins, they do transactions. The last time I talked to the founder uh, a few years ago, uh, I asked him whether they are ever going to implement SQL. He said no, but I don't know whether that's changed uh, since then. So we're going to have this JSON-based API. They're going to have, they don't have a query optimizer. They don't have a query planner. They basically just have heuristics to figure out what indexes you want to use and, and use some light statistics to do join ordering. The one actually interesting thing they do for their query optimizer, uh, which is sort of seems like a hack, but it is actually an interesting idea, is they, when you want to figure out what the best query plan is, rather than trying to pick the best one, they, pick, they generate a bunch of them, and then they execute all of them and see what everyone comes back first. Whatever one's the fastest, that's the one they end up using. Right? So that's what I mean by a random walk. They sort of just randomly try different query plans, and then they figure out which one is faster. Right? And, they, they, and every thousand times you execute query, they try that again. So they support UDFs. Uh, this is very J JavaScript influenced, so that all the UDFs are in JavaScript, but they encourage you not to do that for whatever reason. Um, in the newest version, they support server-side joins, but I think it's only left outer joins. And then 2018, now they supported multi-document transactions. So we talked about the distributed architecture before, um, but I'll just go over it again. So they have a heterogeneous distributed components, meaning different nodes are going to be uh, involved in, or responsible for, for different activities or different roles in the system. It's a shared nothing architecture with a centralized query router and, and transaction coordinator. They do master-slave replication. And probably the biggest selling feature about MongoDB, in addition to this JSON stuff, was that they support auto sharding. So the idea here was you shard your database, and over time, if a shard gets too big, they'll automatically split it for you and move it to another machine to sort of do auto, to load balancing automatically. And I think what happened was uh, a lot of startups ended up using MongoDB, although they didn't need a distributed database and they didn't need this auto sharding stuff. Uh, you know, no, no startup says, oh, yeah, we're going to go under in a year, right? Every startup thinks they're going to be huge. So they're like, all right, my database is small now, but it's going to grow, and MongoDB is going to be able to grow with me and through this auto sharding stuff, right? Because again, MySQL and Postgres can't do that for you. You have to do this manually. So I think this is actually one of the really interesting ideas um, that they had in the very beginning of the system that was very popular. So we already talked about this before. This is the architecture. Right, you do a lookup into from the application server through this, this Mongo S router. It looks in the config server that has all the information about how the shards are, are split up, and then it gives that information back and tells you what node to go get the data you need. And then now this Mongo S is actually is, is doing support for transactions in a way uh, that, that the early system couldn't do. So uh, MongoDB originally was written using MMAP. I have made strong declarations before, and I'll say this again, using MemMap for your database is a terrible idea. Uh, like, think of it as a poor man's buffer pool. Instead of using the OS, or instead of running the buffer pool manager yourself, you let the OS do it. The OS is always going to do a bad job. So they were all in with MMAP. They, they made public claims of why MMAP was a good idea. But then in 2015, they bought this startup called Wire Tiger, uh, and now the MMAP engine is gone. It's been deprecated, and now they use Wire Tiger, which is an awesome database system. It's an awesome storage manager that has a real buffer pool manager. And they got way better performance and way better reliability. So in the same way MySQL, you can plop in different storage engines. You can replace InnoDB with, with other things. In MongoDB version 3, you can replace the, the backend storage manager with different engines. So the default is, is WireTiger, but you could use RocksDB or other things if you wanted to. Okay. I, you know, so I, I realize that's a, that's a really raunchy story for me to guys tell you, but like, 
it just the, the end of the day, just realize anytime you're talking to somebody on the street, make sure they're not a cop, and make sure they don't have a gun, okay? <laughs> All right, guys. So, my concluding remarks for the semester. I love databases. You have no idea, right? Uh, so, I think they're awesome. Anything you're going to do throughout your life, whether you, you stay in computer science or you go out in other fields, you're going to come across databases, right? And there's so many different aspects and so many different problems you have to solve in them. And we, you know, the, the 25 lectures we had this semester barely covered everything you need to know, right? There's, I'm learning all the time that even I, there's stuff I don't know about. Um, so, but what I want you to get out of this course is, is not so much that I think you can go off and go build your own database. You could at this point you, if you wanted to. But when you go out in the real world and, and you have to make a, a, you know, a, an engineering decision about either how to, to store data or manage it or what database system you want to use, now you can actually make an educated decision. Right? Now you're not picking things because it was, you know, showed up on Hacker News or because you like the name. Right? Now you can say, well, my workload looks like this. The architecture of this system looks like this. Is, is it going to be making the correct trade-offs for my application to achieve the things I want to achieve? Right? So the other thing I'll also say too is, is there's no one system is completely better than another. There's obviously shit systems, right? but there's a lot of really good ones, open source and commercial. So what I would caution though is I would not, uh, I would not make premature op optimizations in your decision of a database system based on what you think you're going to need you know, some months or years from now. Right, because you may be, you may never get there because the system you're picking is is not what you need for right now. So another way to say this is, MySQL and Postgres might just be good enough for 99% of the things that are out there. Right, they're open source, they're rock solid. All this sort of specialized exotic stuff, you may need that later. But if if, if you're at the point where Postgres is not able to keep up with 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 your workload needs to do, chances are you have money. Right, and that means you can hire people that are really smart, or you pay, either pay you guys a lot of money to go make a decision on how to actually scale that thing up or out, and then maybe look at other different database systems. So that's the one thing that I would say that I, I see over and over again. Students come back to me, they say, "Hey, I'm thinking about doing a startup. I want to pick a database system," and I always say Postgres or MySQL. It's like, oh no, what, what if I want to distribute a database? I'm like, you have one gigabyte of data that fits on a single machine. You don't need a distributed database. Right? You're executing 10 transactions a second. You don't need anything fancy. So just avoid a lot of uh, headaches and doing things that are overly complicated at the very beginning. Get, get something rock solid first, and then you can, you can figure out how to, to scale up later. OK? All right, guys. So that's it. Uh, good luck with all your exams. Good luck with Project 4. Good luck with the extra credit. Uh, and good luck with the snow. OK? All right, guys. It's been awesome. Thank you. See you. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes, it's the S T Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cuff, so y'all yeah, cause I drink proof. Put the bust a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come, Willie D. That's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central, G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the 40. A six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>